Have you seen the note from the little child who was being homeschooled? This little note went viral during this quarantine. And uh, here's what the note said. You can see it right here. Yeah, little Ben, he said, it is not going good. My mom's getting stressed out. My mom is really getting confused. We took a break so my mom can figure this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it is not going good. <laughs> I love that. It was hilarious. His mom's just trying to homeschool this guy. And well, as he put it, it is not going good. <laughs> How well is it going at your house right now? <laughs> Listen, I, I wanted to do these videos that we're going to do together here for the next few weeks to help pause the noise and just to bring our homes back to the most important thing, and that is living for Jesus Christ. So that's what these little videos are going to be about on Wednesdays. The format that I'm going to use is that I'm going to teach for a few minutes and then I'm going to ask you to pause it, pause the video, and then discuss some questions that I'll have here on the screen for you. And, uh, and then you push pause or push play again and I'll finish some more teaching and then you can pause and discuss and then we'll be done. It'll only take a few minutes, but this is something so families or couples or grandparents with, with young ones, whoever. Uh, maybe you want to even watch this and then call someone later and discuss some things. But this is a way just to bring everybody back to uh, midweek to what we're supposed to be doing, living for Jesus in this world. Now, I've chosen to continue with what I was teaching in Adult Bible Fellowship several Sundays ago. Uh, I just got to change the title slightly to adjust to this unique time that we're in. So here's the series that I've been teaching. It's called First Peter, How to Live for Christ in a Hostile World. How to Live for Christ in a Hostile World. Um, I'm going to change it a little bit now and put a slash there and say hostile slash uncertain world. So how to live for Christ in a hostile or uncertain world. Um, let me just set it up this way real quick, this portion of our teaching. The, the Christians in Peter's day were facing extreme persecution. And I mean extreme. Nero, he was the Roman emperor, and this guy was a madman. Uh, he, he killed Christians for fun, for sport. And many Christians at that time had to hide in caves or underground just to escape his cruelty. Uh, the Romans themselves, the, the, just the Roman way of life, was completely anti-Jesus, and they really looked down on Christians. So, <clears throat> Peter writes a letter to uh, be distributed, this letter, among all the churches uh, in, the, in this area, and, and he wants to tell them in, in this letter how to live in that kind of environment. The government's against you, your boss might be against you, uh, your friends might even be against you, the people in the workplace and everywhere you go. But how do you live in that kind of environment? Now, although we are not anywhere near this kind of persecution, the principles that Peter gave are just as relevant now as they were 2,000 years ago. So, and that's what good truth principles will always be like. Uh, you can transfer those principles to any context, any situation, in any part of the world, and they will work and they will make sense uh, because they're God's truth principles. And so this portion that we're going to look at today, this portion of Scripture, is Peter's practical principles, if you will. Uh, chapter Chapter 3 that we're about to look at is going to get very, very practical, and it's perfect for this moment that we're in and the situation you're in at home where it just may not be going that well. <laughs> All right. In chapter 2, Peter was talking about how to properly relate to the government as a Christian. And then he talked about how to relate to our superiors in the workplace as a Christian. And so, and then a few weeks ago, we talked about Peter was discussing how to be in the home, how to, how to live in the home as a Christian, in particular husbands and wives and how they should treat each other. But now he moves to the church, 
the church itself, church life and Christians, how, how should they live uh, in community with each other? But this is also has just wonderful practical uh, ex examples and thoughts for us in our homes as well. So this is going to be very, very helpful for all of us in our homes right now as we're just rubbing off on each other quite a bit. All right. So here's the title for this portion of scripture that we're going to look at for today. And that is obligations for Christians in all situations. All right. Obligations for Christians in all situations. It does not matter what situation you're in. Here's the obligation that God has for us, for me, for you, all of us. All right, we're going to look at two of the obligations today. And uh, here's, let's look at our verse, verse 8. Okay, here's what Peter says. He's writing to them and he says, finally, just like a good pastor would write, you know, he still has a couple chapters to go, but he says, finally. <laughs> anyway, finally, be ye all of one mind. Be ye all of one mind. Having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. I want to take a look at this first phrase here, be ye all of one mind. What's the first obligation? Well, here's my question for us all. What differentiates a Christian in the world? It's not health and wealth that is the mark of a Christian. It's what you find in this verse right here. That's what God wants it to be. These are the things that should characterize us as believers. And the first thing he mentions here is unity. Unity. Be ye all of one mind. God has called his church, his people, to have oneness of mind. What does that mean? Well, first, let me tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that we never differ from one another. In fact, the statement, if you look at it, be ye all of one mind, the statement implies that we all come from different places, or else God wouldn't have to command us to all be of one mind. So the main point here is not to be a person who causes division. You have your thoughts, I have my thoughts, but you need to be of one mind. You know, there's a guy I worked with a long time ago uh, when I worked at the car wash uh, many years ago, and he was a young guy, he was a Christian, and, uh, but he believed that you could lose your salvation if you did something wrong or whatever. And so we would get into discussions every now and then. Uh, I liked him, but he, would, he liked to debate this issue. And one day, I remember we had some dead time and we were standing around and he really wanted to debate this issue. Uh, the problem was that there was another person there that was listening to our conversation. And this person was an unbeliever. And I, we had, and I had been trying to uh, help this lady come trust Jesus as her Savior. And I think he, he was wanting that too. But in this moment, he wasn't even thinking about that. He just wanted to debate his, his point. And I turned him off as quick as I could. I didn't want to discuss this. In my mind, I was thinking the mission that we're trying to achieve here uh, is far more important than what than you being right or me being right. There's a time, there's a time set aside for, uh, for you be, being right when you want to be right. Uh, discuss these things at a different time. Uh, unity took precedence in that moment. And so the encouragement here is when Bible-believing Christians come together, there is something more important than my right to be right. There's something more important than my right to be right. God says, be ye all of one mind. By the way, as a follow-up to that story, that fella later saw that scripture does say that you that you don't you can't lose your salvation once you truly have it. And now he is a he is a great preacher. And if even if he sees this video, uh, I love him. He's a good brother and he's always preaching uh, the truth. I appreciate that about him. But God says, be ye all of one mind. God wants us to yield our rights and force ourselves to be of one mind with other believers. Here's another question. Whose mind? Be of one mind. Whose mind? Whose mind are we supposed to focus on? Well, remember what Philippians says, let this mind be in you, 
that was also in Christ Jesus. True unity is found when we all submit to the mind of Christ. All of us submitting to the mind of Christ. The church will accomplish more with one mind rather than a hundred minds. So what is the secret to unity? What is the secret to unity? It is humility. The secret to unity is humility. And Paul lays that out in Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at those verses real quick. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, the only way to be of one mind with each other, you and me, is to esteem others better than yourself and to look at the things of others before yourself. That's what Philippians 2 says. It's the only way to be of one mind. I have to let go. I have to humble myself. The secret to unity is humility. And the reason there is strife or disunity in a church or in a home, the reason there is strife in your home or if there is strife in my home and disunity is because we or someone is esteeming themselves better than the other. It's because we're esteeming ourselves better than someone else. Some have pointed out that music is a beautiful example of unity, and it really is. Uh, our faithful drummer, Mike Strickland, he told me one time we were talking about music and I was commending him for a good job he was doing. And he told me this, he said, you know, I, I take a look at the, the music as a whole. I look at every part of the music and I try to play the drums, he said, as a compliment to whatever the song is. I, that means I might have to go down and be more in the background. Sometimes I'll, I'll play a little louder or they'll be a little more aggressive. But my, my desire is to compliment the music and not detract from that message of the song. <clears throat> Mike is a guy who understands unity. He understands unity in music. Uh, that's the beauty of a church. That's the beauty of a home. We don't all sing the same part. We don't all do the same thing, but we sing the same song. We all have a different part, but we have to remember this, the bigness of the issue here. There's a bigger thing that God's trying to do. Now, we, I have some discussion questions here for you. Uh, let's look at them real quick. Why is humility so crucial for unity? Number two, what does humility look like in a church or family? And then number three, list other traits that are important to achieving unity in a church or family. So I want you to take a minute right now, pause the video, and discuss those questions amongst yourself. And I'll come back, and I'll give a quick little teaching on the next one, and then... Have you discussed those? All right, we're back. Now, what's next on Peter's list? Number two, the obligation for Christians in any situation. Number two is compassion. Compassion. The first one is unity. The second one is compassion. Verse eight, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Compassion one of another. You know the Greek word or the Greek word for this word, compassion, you know what it is? Sympathes. Sympathes. It's where we get our word sympathy. It means, literally, fellow feeling. Fellow feeling or suffering or feeling the like with another. Feeling the like with another. That definition is very vivid, isn't it? Fellow feeling. Fellow feeling. This is, what, this is that Christ-like ability... To be able to come next to somebody and talk to them and then feel what they feel based on what they've just told you. It's an amazing ability. I have to tell you, though, what I thought of first when I was studying this, and this is probably not the best, but it's the movie Disorderly Orderly. Have you heard of this movie? Jerry Lewis. Uh, I We watched a lot of Jerry Lewis movies when I was a kid, but anyway, Jerry Lewis... In this movie, he suffered from what they called neurotic identification empathy. Neurotic identification empathy. 
The premise is that if someone spoke, Ill, uh, spoke of their illness and we talked about how sick they were or whatever the problem they had, he would feel it physically. The problem is, in this movie, is that he was an orderly at a nursing and a re rehabilitation home. <laughs> it's hilarious, the stuff that takes place. Uh, identification empathy. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Just don't get neurotic about it. But God wants us to have compassion. He wants us to have this identification empathy. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion, sympathy, one for another. Here are a couple questions for you. Do you find it easy to feel what others are feeling? Can you identify with the pains and the sorrows of others? In my observation, some find it easier to do that. Like my wife. She's quick to understand and feel what a person is feeling. It amazes me. She'll talk to somebody and immediately she knows and almost can feel what that other person is feeling. Perhaps that's because she has that spiritual gift of mercy that's a little stronger on her list. Or she has just that female nurturing trait. Or actually, maybe she's just more like Jesus than I am, which is probably more likely the truth. But I want to say this, just because she might find it quicker to feel what others are feeling, it doesn't give me an excuse I need to be more compassionate. I need to be more sympathetic to the needs around me. Someone has said this, and I think it's very wise. Selfishness and compassion cannot coexist. Selfishness and compassion cannot coexist. So let me ask you again. Do you feel the pain of others? Do you feel the pain of others? Do you feel what people are going through right now during this quarantine or, or during the coronavirus if they would have that? Or the, the medical staff or the grocery store workers, the people you come in contact with. Do you feel what they are feeling? And let me just say this. The home church, you folks, you are amazingly compassionate. I, I'm always amazed at what I see, and it's never been more evident than right now during this season, this time in our history. In fact, just today, somebody stopped by the office with an envelope of cash and handed it to me and said, please give this to somebody in need. That's amazing. Thank you, church. Thank you, church, for being the church, for being compassionate, being what Jesus told us to be. Keep Keep up that compassion and keep up that generosity. Now, let me give you a quick thought I heard from someone about the compassion of Jesus. Someone has said this, in the Gospels, it was always compassion and. When you see compassion written about in the Gospels, it always is compassion and. Here's what he meant. Jesus had compassion and healed them. It says Jesus had compassion and fed them. Jesus had compassion and taught them. Every time you see compassion, it follows up with an action. Jesus did something about it. For Jesus, compassion was a verb. It always led to action. So make sure you feel compassion. You want to feel it. Have that fellow feeling like Peter talks about in 1 Peter 3. But let it motivate action by helping solve a real need for somebody. Can I ask every member of our church to do something this week and in the, in the weeks following? Here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do. We would love it if everybody in our church, every person that comes to our church, gets a phone call in this next month. Um, so what I'm asking you to do is this. Would you be willing to get on the phone with somebody, somebody maybe you haven't talked to in a while, somebody in the church, you have their phone number, or you can call and get their phone number from me. Um, but I'll give you their phone number, and you just call them and show compassion by listening to them and just checking in on them. There's so many ways to, to be compassionate, to have fellow feeling for one another. But let's, let's do all that we can during this time, and then just see what God does through this very unique time in history. God's pushing the reset button on the world, 
And, uh, and God's doing something big behind the scenes. So we want to be a part of it. All right, everybody. So here's the next few discussion questions, okay? These are going to be your last ones. Discussion questions. Here they are. Do you find it easy to feel the pains and sorrows of others? Who do you feel compassion for at this time, at this moment? Think about it. And then name a story about Jesus that showed his compassion and his sympathy. And what could you do practically this week to take action on your compassion? So pause and discuss this, and I'm going to come right back and pray. All right, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would heal our land. And Lord, we want to see you work through all of this very unique and um, difficult time for so many. And Lord, help us to be the church at this time. Help us to be unified. Lord, help us to think of others. Help us to be humble. And then, Lord, oh God, that we would have a compassionate heart like you had. And Jesus, that we would be givers and take action. We love you. We praise you, oh God. And bless our homes during this period. We honor and give you glory. Amen. Love you, everybody.